Good morning, everybody. Good morning. What an excellent morning. <laughs> I'm Marina Costello. I'm the Mineral Systems Branch Head here at Geoscience Australia. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Welcome to the first Distinguished Lecture, Distinguished Geoscience Australia Lecture Series for 2024. This, the Distinguished Geoscience Australia Lecture Series, or DGALs as we like to call them, are a series of presentations nominated by Geoscience Australia staff. It is a prestigious recognition of major achievements and contributions to Earth Sciences. Today we'll be hearing from two awesome speakers Dr. Saleh McAlpine and Mitch Vimer. Dr. Saleh McAlpine is the Senior Advisor for Critical Minerals and Director of Strategy and Analysis in the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division at Geoscience Australia. Saleh completed her PhD in Earth Science at the Australian National University, has experience leading large scientific programs such as the Digital Earth Africa Observation Program, the Trusted Environmental and Geological Information Program, and management of national scale pre-competitive mineral prospectivity projects in the Australian Government's Exploring for the Future program. Saleh has over 10 years of experience contributing to pre-competitive geoscience research within the Australian Government and she also regularly represents Geoscience Australia on international committees, technical standards and other important roles. In Mitch Balmer is Director of the Strategic Basins team in the Minerals, Energy, Groundwater Division, and he will be our second speaker. He was the Program Manager of the Trusted Environmental and Geological Information Program. He has 15 years of experience working across private and public sectors in regulatory, policy, science and program management roles, including basin scale interdisciplinary environmental and geological programs for the Australian Government Previous roles have focused on investigating and accessing the interplay between energy production and the environment, water and society. He has a Bachelor of Science in, with a geology major with honours in economic geology and a Bachelor of Science in forestry from the Australian National University. Please welcome, um, join me in welcoming Sale to the podium. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Marina. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for coming to our presentation today. Today, we are going to share with you the story of the Trusted Environmental and Geological Information Program, some of the science produced and the importance of social and community engagement, the, um, what we delivered, current impacts and lessons learnt in undertaking integrated science for Australia's regions. The science that we enjoy here at GA has the beauty of spanning from the atom scale to the continent. And I want to pause here to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia. To share our scientific findings, get input and improve our practice, we tried hard to engage with the people who live, work and rely on our regions of study. So on behalf of Mitchell and I, I extend this acknowledgement to the First Nations people who we connected with during this program. The Baradabana, Bidjara, Boonthamara, Janga, Koa, Kuma, Mayawali, Mythika, Diari, and Wonkamara peoples. I now want you to cast your minds back to 2021. It was a wild time. Justin Bieber, was number one. <laughs> For those, those of you in the parenting demographic, Paw Patrol the movie was released. <laughs> Crochet and sourdough bread were big. Uh, Within a more government focused context, when the TEGI program commenced in July 2021, the Samuels report had been recently released with recommended reforms to the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. 2022 was an impending election year with climate change increasingly on the agenda and Canberra was about to go into lockdown. 
This is the opportunity we were given. 20 months, a Geoscience Australia-led program working collaboratively with the CSIRO, the need to grow a brand new team very, very fast across both of these institutions. We were given a program with the name Trusted in the title, and that's a bit of a tough one to live up to. Two Basin Regents, which quickly grew, a program funded by the Australian Government Department of Industry, Science and Resources, with potential future stages of work possible. We had support from the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water, on environment and regulatory policy. And the program commenced under the Morrison Government's gas-fired recovery policy, an East Coast energy-focused policy intended to strengthen the Australian economy in the aftermath of COVID. So whilst we knew that our operating environment had challenges, we also know that quality science is enduring and we were determined to have relevance and impact then and into the future. We had a lot to work with. The scope of our program was very multidisciplinary. For each basin region under study, we collated the current state of knowledge for geology, hydrogen, groundwater, conventional and unconventional hydrocarbons, geological storage of carbon dioxide and existing resources. We also undertook geological resource assessments to understand the geological potential for energy generation and geological storage of carbon. This is to ensure we really understood where resource development was most likely, which in turn informs environmental assessment to understand the potential impacts and hazards associated with any of these resource developments. So this program also studied the groundwater, surface water and ecology of these basin regions. The work of the program is publicly available through a data repository hosted on the Geoscience Australia website. And the data collated through this program is a point in time assessment. And it provides an unparalleled baseline for environmental assessment and decision making in these regions of study. The fundamental aims of the program were to improve understanding of impacts of resource development, streamline development where appropriate, whilst meeting the needs of the environment, and to deliver freely available information to support regulation and decision making. So this is the geographic area of the program, the Cooper, Adavale, Galilee and North Bowen Basin regions. Predominantly within the state of Queensland, with the Cooper extending into South Australia and a little bit into New South Wales. But I need you to think in 3D for a minute because these basins have overlying geology. And this study also includes the overlying basins of the Aramanga and Lake Eyre. So this study actually assessed six basins in total across a geographic area larger than Sweden and at depths up to 10 kilometres and it gets bigger. Taking the Adavale Basin as an example, the green area on this image indicates the geological basin extent of the Adavale, where we undertook our geological resource assessments. The blue dashed line is a 50 kilometer buffer, and the shaded area represents the extended region extent for environmental assessments. And this is to allow consideration of potential impacts immediately adjacent to the region of interest. Luckily, we did not have to start from scratch. We were able to build on knowledge and approaches developed over the previous nine years, where Geoscience Australia and CSIRO also worked together in the successful delivery of the Bioregional Assessment Program and the Geological and Bioregional Assessment Program. The key outcome of the BA program was improving the understanding of regional and cumulative scale impacts from coal seam gas and large coal mines something relatively new to Australia at the time. The GBA program focused on environmental and water related impacts of shale and tight gas in three key basins, the Cooper, Isar and Beetaloo. So the TEGI program, the first of these programs led by Geoscience Australia, is testament to the success of the programs that came before. And the success of TEGI is testament to the team who worked on it. It was a privilege leading a program with these people contributing. And I'm now going to share some of their work, introducing our major discipline themes, 
And from this, I hope you will get a sense of the breadth of scientific expertise contained within this team and how they needed to work together to produce an integrated product and deliver trusted environmental and geological information for each basin region. So let's start with basin geology. The scene is set with the geological context, stratigraphic frameworks and structural elements of a basin. This slide shows the stratigraphic framework developed for the Cooper Basin and some accompanying core photographs because it is important to touch base with the original source of this information, the rocks. Stratigraphic frameworks capture the geological groups and formations that make up the sedimentary sequence in a basin. Establing, establishing this sedimentary basin setting allows definition of the stratigraphic intervals that were used within the TEGI program for resource and environmental assessment. Here is an example of structural information in the Cooper Basin. Understanding basin structure is important when assessing the geological potential for resources, but also for interpreting groundwater flow and connectivity at the basin scale. For example, from the base of the Cooper Basin to the top of the overlying Lake Air Basin, the sedimentary sequence is characterised into 14 play intervals for resource assessment mapping but also nine hydrostratigraphic intervals for characterising groundwater systems. A play interval, uh, for the purpose of resource assessment, consists of an interval of sedimentary rock formed by the same geological processes and captures regionally significant reservoirs for potential hydrocarbon accumulations or carbon capture and storage. Other geological information from the program includes play boundaries, corresponding to major geological events that interrupt or change basin sedimentation, paleogeographic maps, interpretation of depositional environments, and 3D basin scale models. Publicly available geological data on the existing knowledge for natural hydrogen, hydrogen storage, coal and minerals were also compiled, as well as known resources across each basin. For the aid of our basin, displayed on the left-hand map, geochemical analyses of gas samples from petroleum boreholes show various concentrations of natural hydrogen. The aid of our basin also has the potential for underground storage of hydrogen in the Boree salt, with salt accumulation thicknesses greater than 100 metres shown here on this map. So Mitch will talk to you about our engagement with community, but it's safe to say that groundwater was a topic that generated the most interest. Groundwater is important for users in many sectors, town supply, agriculture, mining and development. But the information generated in this program has also an important use in understanding groundwater as an asset to protect and manage sustainably. So the groundwater data available is, is generous. <laughs> and this is a map here showing salinity. The amount of salt dissolved in groundwater can influence its potential use. Variations in salinity can also be used to indicate groundwater connectivity and indicate surface water groundwater interaction. So the map on this slide is an example of groundwater salinity, water levels and groundwater flow directions mapped for a single aquifer in the Aramanga Basin, the Winton Macunda Aquifer. The colours on this map range from blue to orange, from fresh to increasingly salty. The patchy nature of the map is also useful information in itself because it indicates the mapped extent of this aquifer. Depending on location, the groundwater in the Winton Macunda Aquifer can potentially be used for a broad range of purposes and some of those are displayed here on the slide. So this slide gives an example of surface water interactions and potential aquifer yield for that same aquifer. Groundwater from shallow aquifers can sustain streams in dry periods and support groundwater dependent ecosystems. Understanding the natural variability in groundwater interactions with surface water can be used to determine when there are potential changes caused by resource or development activities. 
The potential aquifer yield, this figure here, is the amount of water that can be pumped from a bore and is an important factor in calculating hydrogen generation potential, which you'll see later. It is calculated using unallocated groundwater reserves, changes in direction and slope of water levels, as well as other factors such as the size and connectivity of the pore spaces within an aquifer. Other groundwater information collated includes water levels and resource size. A significant amount of this program's work was collating existing information. But analysis and methodology development has also been produced. This slide shows an example of some of the analysis undertaken for groundwater. Movement of groundwater is complicated. Taking place horizontally, vertically, and across different timescales from weeks to millions of years. It is affected by changes in climate, human use, and geological complexities. Understanding how all of these factors interact is an important first step in understanding the system. This is a groundwater conceptualization, which includes the Adaval Basin and the overlying Galilee Basin, and shows the groundwater flow and potential connectivity between the aquifers. The distribution of the aquifers is shown here in blue, and the aquitards are shown in brown. This slide shows the average salinity, potential aquifer yield, and confidence along the cross-section lines. The confidence ratings of the compiled data are a new thing that we developed as part of this program and are based on the number of groundwater measurements, when they were collected, and the spatial density of water bores and petroleum wells from which this data was extracted. The confidence for each aquifer information for the basin was an important thing to combine into an overall confidence rating and an important factor when communicating this work. We don't know it all. The resource assessments of this program are also examples of new analysis and new methodology. Based on the geology, resource assessments of energy and geological storage of carbon dioxide were undertaken. The approach we use in Geoscience Australia is the play-based exploration workflow that has been developed and refined by the petroleum industry over several years. This play-based workflow involves a spatial evaluation of the key risk elements for each of the play intervals defined. For conventional hydrocarbons, these risk elements include the presence and effectiveness of reservoirs and seals, trap presence and hydrocarbon charge. And these are the layers of assessment that are represented on this slide. These layers are stacked to produce a composite map and subsequent resource assessment. Geoscience Australia's aim is to develop a nationally consistent approach for assessing the yet to find potential of sediment hosted resources, with a particular focus on prospectivity assessments of future energy resources. This is an example of a resource assessment map for conventional hydrocarbons in the North Bowen Basin. And the key elements that were evaluated and stacked to produce this map are listed on the slide. Green on this map represents high conventional hydrocarbon prospectivity and red low. This is ex an example of a resource assessment map for the same area, but this time showing unconventional hydrocarbon prospectivity. The colours are the same. Green represents high unconventional hydrocarbon prospectivity and red low. Supporting the Australian Government's commitments of net zero by 2050, the geological storage of carbon dioxide has also been assessed, with the purpose of storing captured carbon dioxide safely underground, typically in saline groundwater. This example here is the assessment result for the Betts Creek Rewon play in the Galilee Basin region. The image on this slide shows where areas are classified from high prospectivity green to low prospectivity red depending on the potential for geological storage of carbon dioxide. For this play interval, areas with high prospectivity are south of the Barcaldon Ridge. Areas with low prospectivity for geological storage include the Powell Depression, where injectivity is reduced due to hosting thin reservoirs with low permeabilities. This next example of work 
is quite a good example of the integrated nature of our program. It brings together multiple disciplines and program information on geology, groundwater, renewable energy and energy generation potential. This is a green hydrogen or renewable hydrogen um, production potential map for the Cooper Basin. Renewable hydrogen is generated using renewable energy, solar, wind, to convert water into hydrogen via electrolysis. The renewable hydrogen potential was assessed using that same play-based resource assessment methodology and includes assessment of the overlying Aramanga and Lake Eyre basins within this Cooper Basin region. Each parameter was racked, ranked and stacked to produce this overall resource assessment, identifying areas where renewable energy can be used to desalinate and electrolyze water. The presence of a Cenozoic aquifer throughout most of this basin, combined with high renewable energy potential, resulted in areas of the Cooper Basin having moderately high potential for hydrogen generation. I now want to bring us up to the surface and demonstrate how the program also combined surface information with this subsurface information. The slides I am now presenting are areas of CSIRO's expertise. The program collated the existing information of catchments and watercourses, including stream flow quality and quantity, inundation and climatological data. So this map is an example from the North Bowen Basin and it's quite a complicated one. It provides information on average water availability. So these are the background colours on this map. Water availability provides an indication of where water is generated in a catchment, leading to runoff or groundwater recharge. Those are the blue colours here. And areas where there is accumulation of water, but more loss of water than there is rainfall, such as on a floodplain. And those colours here are shown in the orange and reds. This map also contains the mean annual stream flow across the basin region. This is the dark blue overlay. This is particularly useful for stakeholders managing changing surface water availability. Other environmental information collated includes ecology. This slide gives an example over the Galilee Basin, capturing the existing knowledge of the ecosystems. On the map, you can see the bioregions represented in the different colours, including the Mitchell Grass Downs and the Desert Uplands, all of which have unique environmental assets, unique flora and fauna. Of 522 priority assets identified across the basin regions, 242 are within the Galilee Basin Extended Region. This map shows the number of assets in the Galilee region, including red hotspots here, and here, where there are up to greater than 25 priority assets within that single area. So that was a bit of a whirlwind tour, and there's so much work contained in this desktop study that we've undertaken. But now I want to bring what I can together for you. I want to introduce causal networks developed by CSIRO. This integrates the information from resource and development type through to the environmental assets that may be impacted. Causal networks are built from thousands of individual pathways. This is one example. Each pathway includes a resource development driver that requires activities that cause stress on natural processes that affect an endpoint that support an asset of importance for the region. Now bear with me. This pathway here is for green hydrogen, renewable hydrogen production. And showing the links to the activity, in this case, a wind farm, that requires some vegetation removal for construction, which then reduces habitat condition where it occurs. If we consider the koala as an asset, and some of its potential habitat might include eucalypt woodland, vegetation removal could impact on the condition of that koala's habitat. We, pro we follow this process for each link in the network. The previous slide illustrated one pathway. However, there are several activities related to hydrogen generation that, re that require removal of vegetation, for example. 
Here we can see other activities that lead to the same impact. Transport, water treatment, um, and links that connect those activities to vegetation removal. So everything that requires infrastructure generally will cause vegetation removal, leading to habitat fragmentation and loss, and then potentially impact on a range of ecosystems. So this logic flow forms the basis of the diagram shown on the next slide. Brace yourself. <laughs> We are not just looking at wind farms associated with hydrogen generation. We are also looking at more hazards than just vegetation removal. Now, I don't expect you to read this diagram, but it is building the narrative of the potential issues and pathways that start with resource development and end with an ecosystem and a list of assets. So this causal network uses renewable hydrogen as the example, the example of the development driver. Through this program, an additional four development drivers were considered. So this image gets a lot more complicated. We have causal networks for renewable hydrogen, gas CCS hydrogen, which is hydrogen generated from gas electricity, coupled with carbon capture and storage. Conventional hydrocarbon development, unconventional hydrocarbon development, and specifically coal seam gas development types. There's something for everybody here. This integrated network relies on knowledge from the TEGI program. The TEGI program contains that information of geology, resources potential, development activities, mitigations, legislation, regulations, water, environment, ecology and more. Look, it's a lot. And I'd now like to welcome Mitch Bomer to the stage to take you back into the human world and remind us why all of this is important. Thank you. Thanks, Sale, and thank you, Marina, for your kind introduction. So we've heard about the breadth of amazing scientific work that was undertaken by the team across Geoscience Australia and CSIRO. But let's take a step back for a second. Why did we do this? Well, in fact, why do any of us do the things that we do? Yes, we do it because it's our job, and we want to do a good job. We want to do it well. But whether we want to study the incredible landscapes of our great country, or see amazing mineral pleochroism, pleochroism under a microscope. Yep, I studied mineralogy. <laughs> we work here because we enjoy our field of science. But perhaps more than that, we want to share this with as many people as we can. What we want is for our work to be useful and used. We want it to be relevant. And most of all, we want it to be valued, right? We want it to get the tick of approval or the thumbs up. Okay, that's great, but how do we do that? And there are many ways to ensure that our work is valued or successful, and perhaps one of the best ways is by engaging with the people who need it. By working with people who can use this information in their day-to-day -day lives, and by communicating to those people in a way that can be understood. Because in the end, all that marvellous science is only as good as the people who benefit from it. Ensuring benefit is one of the ways we can measure success. Now, earlier in the year, Sala gave a fantastic presentation on communicating complex science. And so if you haven't seen it, I would recommend going to GA's YouTube site and checking it out. But in that presentation, Sala gives a good quote about the TEGI program. It went something like this. Even though this is a desktop assessment, all science happens somewhere. This is someone's land and on someone's country. So we better start talking to people. And that's what we did. And here we are talking with a Bidjara guide on a cultural walk along the Warrago River at Charleville. <laughs> and so to talk to people, we set up the Basin Reference Group. And it included members from Commonwealth, state and local government, industry representatives from energy, minerals and relevant other regional industries. It included First Nations Australians groups, peak bodies, local water users and natural resource management bodies. And I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank each of the approximately 80 individuals from this group that we worked with over the life of the program for their time, honesty and advice. The reference group was a way for us to communicate with these important potential information users. But communication needs to be more than talking. It's a two-way street. The reference group was a way for us to share our work, 
but also to sit back and listen to their needs and clearly demonstrate how we act on their feedback. After all, these are the people that need the Teggy information, so it needs to work for them. These are the people who live in, work on, care for and rely on the regions we studied, and it is by their value and uptake of the information that we can measure success. And this program is about making that data and information freely and equally available to everybody who needs it. So they need to understand it, and more importantly, they need to trust it. Now, I should say that the way we implemented the Basin Reference Group was adapted and modified from the user panel approach from the Geological and Bioregional Assessment Program. And we use this approach deliberately. Working directly with the people who live, work, rely on and care for land ensures that the people who are directly affected by our work have a say at the table. Uh, this is a diagram here by an incredible uh, CSIRO social scientist and philosopher called Dr Justine Lacey. And it shows why such an approach is important to support user-driven science and uptake. By engaging, talking, making sure their concerns are not just heard, but taken on board and legitimised, we can demonstrate that their concerns, ideas, questions were all relevant and were all equally deserved to be heard. It didn't matter if a certain individual was against industry or pro-development. Their matters just needed to be delivered in a way that was respectful. And this is the environment we encouraged at each of our meetings. And this approach gave our Basin Reference Group and their constituents, by extension, the opportunity to have a fair go. This builds trust, sorry, this builds community and a sense of ownership. It encourages trust, trusted environmental and geological information program. Now all of that's great, but if we couldn't demonstrate that the group's trust was important to us, for our science, we would quickly lose that trust. All right. So to quickly bring us back, uh, because who doesn't love a good governance structure? <laughs> Perhaps it's just me, but bear with me. I'm going to go somewhere with this. Here you can see that we operated under a governance process that demonstrated how we acted on basin reference group discussions. The user advice that you can see here on the left in orange comes from our basin reference group. It feeds directly to decisions on the program operation made by the program leadership group this central bubble here. And the program leadership group in turn fed that up to the highest governance body, the executive level board. Now this shows that to the program, the user advice from the basin reference group is on par with the advice of scientists and that it is fed directly to the top. And this goes a long way to demonstrate the value of the reference group's input and engagement and by extension, the value of the program's work to them reinforcing trust in the program. Now finally, and perhaps more importantly, there is a feedback loop, like you can see here, coming down from the program leadership group, where we would, re we would return to the basin reference group to update them on, their how, on how their matters were being incorporated into the program's products. This is an important gesture that demonstrates we were actively listening to their needs. So the program in effect ran for less than two years and in that time we held five meetings with our Basin Reference Group. So how do you build a sense of community and celebrate diversity of opinion among such a group who in many cases wouldn't normally meet or even talk together? All while in the middle of COVID lockdowns. <coughs> well, it's not easy and I'm not here to say how we did it was perfect. But we did constantly evolve and adapt our approach. So often the tools or methods we had to work with were not ideal for everybody in the room. Our first reference group meeting was an online only Microsoft Teams meeting. And during COVID, this was really our only option and it served its purpose. But it is difficult to build rapport while behind a screen. And also part of the point of the base and reference group was to encourage people to talk to other groups who they wouldn't normally engage with. And this typically happens over lunch or coffee. Those side conversations outside of the normal presentations are often where the best relationships are built. Feedback from the virtual meeting was incorporated into the following meeting, a hybrid meeting. And this was designed to give our reference group members the opportunity to attend in person, or if that was not possible, to listen and engage through Microsoft Teams. 
So, and according to feedback on the hybrid approach, many of our group uh, thought that the hybrid meeting was preferred over an online only meeting. However, opinion on the hybrid format was mixed. So it appeared you either liked it or you didn't. Yeah, much like a hybrid car or Lincoln Park's hybrid theory. <laughs> so we continually evolved our approach, supported by the relaxation of COVID restrictions, until we were finally able to meet in the region. And so we plotted a course, shown here, and embarked on the Basin Reference Group Roadshow. Over the course of a week, we stopped for three meetings, one in Longreach, one in Charleville, and one in Rockhampton. While this was an exceptional logistical challenge, it was truly worthwhile in terms of getting the right members of community and the regions into the room for discussion. Another way we learnt or evolved was in how we communicated our work during the Basin Reference Group Roadshow. By this time, we had tried several approaches to deliver the program's information, and we knew it was important to give our reference groups direct access to the scientists doing the work, but it wasn't always possible for us to know exactly which, what each group wanted to know before the meeting, which kind of made it pretty difficult to prepare or tailor the information to what they wanted to know on the day. So what did we do? We took everything and we put it to the audience to guide us. We posed questions such as, what topics are of most importance or concern to you? Where in the basin are you most interested in further information? And we worked through that information like a choose your own adventure book, showcasing the information on a given basin or science discipline, depending on what the audience wanted to explore. Now the roadshow was a great achievement, no doubt, but it did occur at an awkward and difficult time for the TEGI program. If you cast your mind back to the start of this talk, do you remember some of those challenges that Saleh described? Well, the looming election came around and resulted in a change of government, and a change of government led to the early completion of the program. And before this point in time, we had been openly discussing what opportunities there might be in the next stage for the program. For example, working on country to do field work to fill information gaps that were identified. And we had to be upfront with the group and say that the program would not be continuing further once we had finished this stage of work, which would mean no field work to address the data matters that they had raised. And even though this was not the news that the Basin Reference Group wanted to hear, because we had built up the group's sense of community and had been honest with them, we were able to have this difficult conversation frankly and respectfully. And perhaps for me, one of the most important lessons I learned from having this difficult conversation three times over was that the response was similar across the regions. That, data, that a data collection program like TEGI, even a desktop analysis, is seen as critical for all of the people who live in, work on, care for, or rely on a region. What we learned was that even a desktop study by government is a demonstration of needed investment in the region. So when you're working, it is important to remember that even though you may not know it, your work has a resounding impact on the people who may not even know you're undertaking that work. Uh, and just quickly, um, above the picture there of us being taught about local bush tucker in Rockhampton, I've put a couple of nice quotes from our program evaluation. And these quotes show the importance of communication but I'll come back to evaluating the program in just a minute. Um, all right, as I said earlier, communication is a two-way street. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on this slide because we heard and learnt a lot from our Basin Reference Group. We heard what works, what doesn't work, what we could do better, and what is absolutely essential to do while working with them. Being able to sit back and listen and learn from some exceptionally passionate and generous people is probably the part of this program that sticks clearest in my mind. Because we had built a level of trust among the group, they were more than comfortable giving frank feedback. And sometimes this resulted in an uncomfortable or difficult conversation, but it was always held with respect. And even after such frank conversation, people kept coming back to find out more and keep engaging with the group. So, some of the things that we learnt were making sure that you engage early. We need to work with stakeholders and First Nations people as soon as possible. 
It's very difficult to bring together so many groups from an area greater than the size of a large European country, but working together earlier is something that most programs need to do. Working together earlier could, inc could include something like co-design. <laughs> this is currently something that government doesn't necessarily do often, but doing so would mean that from the start of a program, its outputs are going to be more relevant and accessible and meaningful. Working with First Nations Australians early would also have allowed us to incorporate their traditional knowledge. And this was really one of the biggest missed opportunities for our program. Early on, an assumption was made that to map cultural information would not be possible to do well in the short time frame that we had. And that an incomplete job would be more disrespectful than not doing it at all. So it was left out of scope. Something that we would definitely change if we had our time again. Which brings me to the next point, don't assume, ask. This simple step could have saved several difficult conversations and we were told to simply pick up the phone and check. A good tip in this modern age of screens and emails. I've talked a bit about the importance of listening and I appreciate all the listening that you're all doing today. Listening is a simple way to build trust and respect and can be demonstrated in many ways. For example, the distribution of a communique after a meeting to show we were listening and acting on what was raised. I also mentioned earlier the importance of actually visiting the regions and meeting on country. And we heard in no uncertain terms that meeting in the region was the clear preference if it's at all possible. Language. This is an interesting one. And it goes to both the words that you use in presenting information and how they're interpreted. For example, jargon and complex terms used for non-technical audiences can diminish our work's value and encourage distrust. But also things like being careful not to call First Nations Australian stakeholders. That's fair enough. It's their country. They have more than a mere stake in its outcome. And the last point I'll raise today, which is by no means the only other thing we learnt, investing in relationships. It is so important to dedicate time to connect early, consistently, and provide opportunities for discussion, feedback, and tailored education on scientific outputs. This needs to continue past the lifetime of a program's funding envelope. The building of a community around the base and reference group was one of its biggest achievements. And community needs to be supported in the take up and understanding of the information that will affect it. All right, moving on to delivery. Under TEGI, we've taken what we learnt from the Basin Reference Group and adapted that into the program's delivery. What we'd heard, both during this program and from earlier programs, was that dense and complex reports were very hard to use by many of our groups. So, to make the programs work more accessible, all of the amazing science completed by the team was adapted into dis discipline-specific data guides. One guide per region, per discipline theme. 53 of them to be specific. And each guide was designed as an entry point to the data available to give the reader a taste of what information has been collected, what data supports it, and why the data and information collated is important to that reader. And then the guide gives the current state of play for the data available, a region-wide uncertainty analysis. This is what they look like. Each data guide is approximately four to six pages in length. The amount of text is minimised, but its impact is maximised by describing what the reader should be focusing on with this type of data and why it's important to them. And then the data guide gives a quick example of the types of assessments or purposes for that type of data. For example, here for the Galilee Basin, we let the reader know that groundwater interacts with the surface water where the Galilee Basin is exposed near or at the surface. And why is that information important? Because it helps to inform where water is used in the landscape and where those interactions may support vulnerable environmental assets. Each theme with inner discipline notes where the data comes from and where it's available. This way, anyone who wants to dive deeper into the information can go ahead and download it and analyze the data in their own software. The last thing that I'll note is that we've also mapped uncertainty for each type, data type in the region for the first time. And this is important because it can tell you where further data collection should be prioritised or where for the moment 
data coverage for an area is high. The data guides and the information with them all is accessible through a dedica dedicated web page. The web page provides a landing point for general users with the basic information on the region and multiple ways to access the data and information. So if you're after just some basic information on the basin regions assessed, or really want to dive down into the detail, it's all available there on the web page. All right, so we've delivered all this really useful baseline data. How then do we demonstrate that the program delivers impact? As we've discussed, this program delivered, this is a program delivered through some very unique challenges. And it's important to recognise that just because we weren't able to undertake some further field-based work, the program still has a significant amount to call its legacy. To inform this, we have just completed an independent evaluation of the program, the point of which was to look at what went well, what could have been better, and what further lessons need to be applied in the future. Very deliberately, the evaluation sought feedback from our basin reference group and other stakeholders, and their feedback is absolutely critical to understanding where the program's impact lies. TEGI is forward-looking. I mean, we've investigated hydrogen and hydrogen storage. These are resource types that in some cases have application that is yet to be realised. So how do we measure impact for such a forward-looking program? I've drawn out a couple of important points from the evaluation which go to impact and scientific benefits. As sources of foundational baseline knowledge, the program's outputs are useful for informing future decisions on resource development. What are the things that we should know about, protect, or explore? But specifically, foundational science programs like this offer an opportunity for future work. So things like con continued impacts, uh, future benefits, and government mandates give us some good ideas about you know, that impact. Uh, so let's have a look at some of these. TEGI itself is providing valuable data and information to inform a deep dive of the Adabal Basin. The Data-Driven Discoveries Program has previously and continues to leverage work completed through TEGI. Not just in terms of the data that has been collated and built into the program, but also by continuing the relationships we built through TEGI with the people living within the region. For example, there's a lot of interest in the Adabal Basin for its potential to store hydrogen. And we can see from the data downloads and the communication with both government and industry that the TEGI data and information is highly sought after in this area. And speaking of relationships, in a collaboration with the Exploring for the Future program, we've been able to leverage the program to work closer with the Lake Eyre Basin Ranges, with the aim of building groundwater knowledge and monitoring capacity for them. Work across Geoscience Australia continues on improving how we provide access to our work to a range of audiences, including on updates to interactive data and communication portals, and the TEGI work has fed into this process. TEGI has developed several methodologies, for example, the play-based resource assessments, and leveraging that to explore the potential for renewable hydrogen production from groundwater is an approach first tried in Geoscience Australia through TEGI. The play-based resource assessment work is a great example of adapting work approaches to meet the needs of your audience as this is an approach industry is very familiar with. And there are also numerous applications for the groundwater uncertainty and modelling work started by the program's groundwater team. Finally, the program's approach to integrating across disciplines the causal network. This is a powerful tool being wielded by some very clever people in CSIRO, and it continues to improve in its applicability across disciplines. CSIRO is working with the National Water Grid to apply their work started under the TEGI program to support appropriate water use and management in an emerging hydrogen industry. And finally, TEGI worked closely with government to ensure that all of our data, information and methodologies suited the needs of environmental regulators, including the Commonwealth Environmental Regulator. We continue to engage with them to make sure that TEGI's work can support them wherever possible under the reforms that are occurring under the Nature Positive Plan. So, by leaving a legacy of baseline data, a legacy of future opportunity, a legacy of scientific methods, and a legacy of an approach that can be leveraged to support a range of government objectives, the TEGI program demonstrates that complex and high quality science can be produced and delivered 
under a changing policy environment and still be deliver beneficial impact. It was a program born during challenging times, one that assembled a team from scratch, worked and communicated and built an engagement community, and one that delivered results and beneficial impacts that are being both realised now, but also have great potential into the future. The program's approach is one that can easily be leveraged to support a range of critical government initiatives, supporting reforms while also meeting the needs of community, industry and environmental managers. <coughs> the TEGI program is a case study for how to integrate science across disciplines, across government and across regional Australia. And lastly, through this program, I've been very fortunate to work with many incredible people. People within the program, within government, as well as within industry, communities and Australia's First Nations people. I think I speak on behalf of Saleh, as well as myself, that I would like to finish by acknowledging these people for their time, their honesty and for the value that they brought to the program. And most importantly, I'd like to thank each and every one of them for trusting the program trusting its information and trusting us to tell this story. Thank you.